So what do you need to grow thriving crops? Soil, sun, water, right? Well, maybe not. What if you could grow crops with little to no water? Jill Farrant is a professor and research chair in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And she's currently leading the development of drought-tolerant crops. Now, they're called resurrection plants because they can survive in a drought and then resurrect themselves when they are irrigated. Further developments of these plants can help provide solutions for feeding populations in dry and arid climates around the world. Ferrant's research has received international praise, and in 2012, she was a recipient of the L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women in Science. Joining us from Cape Town to tell us more about the potential impact of her research is Jill Ferrant. Welcome to the show, Jill. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. Well, Jill, let's first start off with your childhood, because I know that your interest in the outdoors and plants began at a very early age, and you spent a lot of time outside. I know there's one story where you went outside once, you saw a dry plant, and then the next day it rained, and it was all vibrant again. You went home and told your dad, and he said, that's impossible. Tell me a little bit about that moment for you. Uh, interesting moment because obviously I was, I was a very observant child, observant because weather drove the mood in our home. If it wa my father was a farmer and if it wasn't raining, that was a problem because the crops wouldn't be watered. If it was raining with hail, that was a problem because the, then the crops would be damaged. So being observant, I actually noticed this dead looking plant. Um, came back and saw it, you know, resurrected the next day, wrote it in my nine-year-old diary and forgot about it, to be honest, for many years later. But it was one thing I, once I, when I discovered the fact that someone else had published about this many, many years later, I thought, wow, I wonder if that's what I noticed. And yes, it was. So at that point then, when you realized that there was something to this, this idea of resurrection plants, is that when you decided, all right, I'm going to go and research this and see what this is all about and maybe it could lead to something new? Yeah, ab no, absolutely. I mean, the moment I was un got un the understanding of how that these plants could lose all of their water, remain in that desiccated state for years before and, and yet still be alive enough to when water comes to resurrect and start growing within 12 hours, I knew that this was a potential solution to drought um, and it wasn't under the where at the time though to what extent drought would be happening in my country and with Africa being a rain fed um, agriculture this is a, a crisis for us at the moment so yeah I'm very lucky that I actually started to do this research some 22 years ago and you've kept at it well Jill since I'm not a scientist and most of our viewers are probably not scientists can you explain to us in layman's terms how a resurrection plant actually works how do they work? Um, the, the big trick is that most living organisms go under a lot of um, stress if they lose water. So resurrection plants, when they first start to feel a drought, immediately perceive that somewhere down the line that there might be something that they might have to lose more water than they really want to at this point. Turn on a whole lot of genes which actually facilitate a, a very safe loss of that water, protecting membranes, protecting all sorts of things that normally fall apart when there is no water in the environment. And the nutshell of my research really is that there are other models out there that do this. Most of our crops, most of our plants produce seeds that, are, that can dry down to very low water content and yet be a, a survive. We store our germplasm um, as seeds. So the phenomenon is not often seen in most plants, in vegetative tissues, but it is in seeds. Now what I have discovered is, and, and lots of collaborators who work with me, um, is that in fact what resurrection plants do is that they use those pre-existing seed genes. They're already in the genome. Yeah. They just switch them on in vegetative tissues when that's normally silenced in a crop. And so the whole trick, I guess I'm telling you where I think you might go for my next question, the whole trick is right now, how do resurrection plants switch on those, seed, those genes in their roots and leaves? Can we mimic that right. in a crop so that when water loss beca or drought becomes severe, the plants simply dry down and wait for the next rain? And so now that's what, that is at the heart of your research, right? Because you're basically trying to create these crops that will mimic this behavior so they can survive through really any kind of condition and still produce uh, and be bearing fruit, right? That's exactly what we're trying to do. 
Um, I do, I know that there are people out there going, oh, how productive will this plant be if it's spending a lot of its time in the dry state? And that's a very real question that we need to answer. But the reality is that as long as there's water, this plant will pick up, start growing, and it in initially, at least, a little bit faster than it would have done beforehand. Mm -hmm. so it's almost to make up a bit of lost time. So in a season where there's sufficient rain, we will have absolutely the normal yield we would always have. In a season with a drought, we will still have a good year. In a season with an extended drought, we will still have a crop. It might not be fantastic. Wow, so it can produce no matter what the conditions are with very little water or uh, plentiful water. That, that's fascinating. And also you said it doesn't take as long as the normal crop. Well, you know, depending on where we're trying to put this, if you're going to put it into an annual, which is uh, a crop which will only grow for a short amount of time in order to get, to get a lot of seed for us to eat, um, we, would ha we would have to maintain that that, that that plant can continue to grow even in a, t in a time where we would not, not normally do so under normal environmental conditions. But what I'm thinking is going to happen, certainly here, is that normal environmental conditions aren't really going to prevail for most of the time. We're going to have extended droughts, a lot of heat. These plants withstand all of that. We will also get a lot of cold and a lot of wet. And so what we're trying to do, I think, in the, in the long term, is to get a very resistant, a resilient crop, a crop that will do well under, under hydrated conditions, but actually won't die under the more extreme conditions. And Jill, uh, you know, w these days uh, we hear so much about the issue of global warming, climate change, these extreme weather conditions that we're having, and one of them being drought, uh, the lack of water. Uh, so if we don't try to pursue things like you're working on, what are we looking at? What's the dire future? I mean, I use that word, but I think that's probably what everybody figures. Uh, it could be very dire if we don't do something about it. Yeah. You know, I think what I'm potentially offering is, is only one of a many other solutions that really have to be evolved. There are going to be areas in our, on our planet where it will be much more conducive to be the, the breadbaskets of the world. And I guess what, must, what we must do is capitalize on those areas and the food must be shared. Then in areas where you're going to have extended droughts, we're going to have to, for local food security and, and subsistence farmers, start growing the crops that are a way more drought tolerant. And my idea is to actually intercrop these, to actually use um, cereals with um, protein rich seeds and things like that so that the subsistence farmer has a balanced diet that will come out um, over a year with various crops that can actually um, grow through various seasons uh, to be productive at the right time. Mm. Jill, I know that uh, the estimates for you are that th is that you want these crops to actually be fully functional through your experimentation in about 10 years' time. Uh, so is that realistic at this point in your research? It's realistic dependent on one condition, that I get enough money to do this. <laughs> um, I think any scientists all around the world always say, wow, we just don't have enough money, we don't have enough money. Um, and, and of course, collaborators and myself who now kind of know, we think we know what we need to do. It's a matter of getting the money and doing it. We are um, writing grants and doing all sorts of things, but given the right amount of money uh, to complete what we think we need to do, I guess proof of concept five years, roll out by 10. Okay. And um, Jill, in terms of what this potentially could do uh, to, for world hunger, and providing the proper nutrition to parts of the world that we all know are suffering from extreme poverty and hunger. Uh, is, this, is this the answer? As I said before, I think it's one answer. I think they mean, we're going to have to be very creative in other ways of producing food too. Um, I, I, I'm hesitant to say that this is going to be a great solution for all of Africa. I think it's going to be a small solution um, a small drop in an ocean that we really need to do a lot more with. Sorry, I'm feeling a bit, it's late at night for me. <laughs> oh, Bigger that's pardon. Okay. I'm stumbling a bit. That's okay. Well, Jill, let me ask you this then. Uh, once you are through with this research, because you're saying about five to ten years time, uh, what's going to be next for you? What's, what's on the horizon? Ah, I'm one of those people who can never say no to a new challenge. Um, one of the big things that we're going to be facing in Africa, is, um, and I think worldwide too, is, is salt stress. Because as the soils get more um, uh, dry, you get a lot of increased salinity and ions and things accumulating. So one of the things we are starting to look at is crosstalk between stresses, crosstalk between water uh, deficit stress, drought, 
and salt stress because often that will go hand in hand. So even as we speak, we are starting to look at, at things like that. For me personally, um, I don't know if I'll ever retire, but I have my dream is to use South African plants, and we have an enormous amount of variety here for medicinal purposes, to try and start letting people be able to grow plants that can be used for food and medicines. Okay. Jill, you know, I'm curious. Uh, some people might look at what you're doing right now uh, with manipulating, you know, these resurrection plants and trying to figure out how they work and the final product being sort of Frankenstein creation uh, because you're manipulating so many things. Uh, is that the case? Are these, are these actually safe? It's a question that everyone asks me, but simply because the perception that genetically modified organisms, genetically modified crops are going to be Franken foods. I feel that the discipline has been given a very bad rap um, because it can be exceptionally safe. It's the ethical reason for what you're doing, what you're doing, the dis using that technology for, is what should be driving the answer. Um, so yes, of course they can be, and I think with all the concern that's around now, we are making sure that they are safe at all levels before they're released to the public. Again, long-term trials have to be done. We might be eating these things for 10 years and find that there's something uh, crazy happens to us. I doubt it. But, you know, those, those are the things we have to face every day. Right. In some of the technology being developed, for example, to make meat, stem cell research from beef, you know. Uh, is that safe? Don't know. Yeah. But working on an animal seems more desirable, and if I may say this, than, than working on a plant in most people's eyes. <laughs> I think, I really think that plants being the base of the food chain, we really need to look after our plants. And Jill, from the scientific community, have you gotten positive feedback? Are they, are they liking what you're doing? In the main, yes. Like, I think most scientists understand what I'm trying to do and how I'm trying to do it, and they applaud that. Um, so yeah, I, I've, I've had very little criticism other than people saying to me, well, you're gonna make GMO foods, how's that gonna affect us? Mm, okay. Jill, you have some plants in front of you uh, on the desk. Can you tell me what, what you have? So the very dry looking uh, twigs here is a, a resurrection plant which has gone green 12 hour, in 12 hours because I put some of those twigs into water. So just to show how rapidly this happens, this plant's been, I, I harvested them two years ago dry. So they are still very much alive and it's just one of the many species I work with. This one has got a fancy name as they all do called Myrothamnus flabellifolius or alias the resurrection bush. Um, it's, it's got a lot of, or well, most of these resurrection plants have incredible chemicals in them to protect against the various stresses they have to uh, survive. And so a tea, why well, I bought this one particularly because a herbal health tea has also been made from the leaves. Um, which is good for stomach complaints, apparently. Highly, high, high in antioxidant. So, Jill, that's amazing. So you harvested those dry plants two years ago, but then you resurrected them in, within 12 hours. That's amazing. Absolutely. It is amazing. I think that, to me, if anyone is interested, there's some videos on my website which actually shows you the, the time lapse of these things going from the extremely dry state, full up and healthy, within 12 hours. Wow, that is incredible. Well, Jill, thank you so much for joining us today. Fascinating stuff you're doing. You're welcome. Cheers.